Well, today on the Deerskin Diary, I want to talk about five simple things that I did to improve my overall 18th century frontier impression. These were things that I noticed right away that I could spend a little bit of money on, or in some cases a little bit more money that I had saved, to get the biggest bang for the buck to turn this impression from something that was mundane to something that was far more memorable. So stick around. I know there's something in here that you're not going to want to miss. And one of the hardest questions to answer is one that quite honestly I don't think I can answer and that's why do I do this? Is this some kind of cosplay where I dress up like somebody that I'm not? Is this some kind of bushcrafting where I test myself against this older technology and skill? And the answer is I don't know. I just know how it makes me feel and I know how much I enjoy doing it and I know the passion that I have for it and after that I choose not to question it too much because I'm afraid that if I do I might be afraid to continue. Now let's talk for a second about the proverbial elephant in the room when it comes to talking about simple things that I can do to improve my 18th century appearance. And that's the presence of my beard. It's a very hot topic for uh, living historians in the 18th century, the presence uh, or the non-presence. Overwhelmingly, it seems like 18th century uh, men were clean shaven or uh, close facsimile thereof. So for me, prior to going to an event where I'm presenting myself as an 18th century person, I will shave my beard down to roughly a week's worth of growth. I don't do this while I'm deer hunting. And as you can see, I don't necessarily do this in all of my videos, but I do think it is another very simple thing and it doesn't have to be all or nothing that I can do to help present myself better as a living historian of the 18th century. Now one of the very first things that I did was to ensure that I not only had chosen the appropriate clothing for the impression that I was trying to convey, but I also took small steps to ensure that the fit of that clothing matched the 18th century style. So what I did is once I chose the different pieces of clothing that I wanted for my impression, I made sure that the fit for that individual unique piece of clothing was the best that I could get to the 18th century style based upon paintings and descriptions. It's not only knowing how the garment is supposed to fit me, it's choosing the garment that's appropriate and knowing how that particular garment is supposed to fit me. Now, one of the first things that I noticed that would make my living history impression even better to literally top it off was the selection of a good hat. Now, the hat that you normally see me wear in my videos is this round blocked wool felt hat. Round blocked meaning the crown itself is round as opposed to oval like so many hats are today. Um, it has a red wool band around the crown of the hat itself it's unfinished along the brim and it's wool felt, which was one of the more common varieties of uh, hat making materials for the lower classes in the 18th century. Now what's important is that this hat is constructed um, in a period fashion. So on the inside is a linen hat lining and it has a leather sweatband. Not all the hats had sweatbands, but nearly every hat had a lining of some sort. And when your hat is made correctly, like this one is, it tends to last longer because as it wears out, it doesn't reveal any um, less than authentic manufacturing methods. Now, one of the more common styles of hat in the 18th century is uh, what's called now a tricorn, but then it was called a cocked hat. And this is an example of a cocked hat. Now, we oftentimes think of all three sides being folded up in a tricorn style cocked hat, but in reality, any side, uh, one, two, or three, could be folded up and attached. To get that classic tricorn shape, we really need all three sides. Now, there's an interesting phenomenon that occurs throughout the reign of the tricorn hat, and many thanks to Matt Brankel, a hat maker, and I'll put a link to, uh, to his Facebook site in the description. That is the letting down of the rear of the hat and the wearing of the hat backwards. And you might have seen this on one of my other videos. It creates a very large hat, but it takes what to me is a useless hat 
this tricorn type of hat right here it doesn't keep the rain off of you it doesn't keep the sun off the back of your neck and it makes it into a useful hat and what i want to point out in talking about this this wearing of, of the hat in that manner is that when i buy a hat that's made correctly i have additional documented period options as to how i wear it and i feel like those personal touches really make for a richer experience One of the easiest sewing projects I did for my 18th century impression was a pair of leggings. Now those leggings easily cover up at least a third of your body. They go from your ankle all the way to above your knees. So they're very, very visible if you wear leggings as part of your impression. Now you have a couple of options on what you would use to make them. You have wool and you have leather. And I have an example of each here. This is a pair of brain tan leather leggings. Now they're form fitted to my legs and they're extremely useful in the woods for turning briars, but they are also uncomfortable when they're wet and they tend to stretch. They're also pretty expensive to make. It took me roughly one brain tan hide per leg to get both the leggings and the straps and the small leather laces to tie them up. Now the leggings that I wear the most are blue wool stroud. Blue happens to be the color that I prefer, but you can get blue, red, or green. They are all documented to the 18th century deerskin frontier era. They were an excellent way for me to practice my sewing skills. These are so simple to make and such an easy thing to do to uh, really boost your impression. Now there are a multitude of places you can purchase blue wool stroud from. I'm gonna put a link in the description for one of the easiest places to get it, uh, along with the other colors. You simply take your piece of wool like so and you wrap it around your leg until you form a tube. Now how do you make that seam? Well once that tube of wool is formed then you want to take and pin. I've seen everything from from push pins to staples. I use safety pins because I poke myself a lot less that way and I simply safety pin the leg in itself to the outside of my leg. That would be the, the outside from just above the knee all the way down to just above the ankle. And if you notice, this is not a straight line. It actually follows the contour of my leg. Once that is done, all I have to do is backstitch a very simple seam from bottom to top. And I'm left with this flap, roughly four inches, maybe a good bit wider in a couple of places. And I might trim that down, but I generally keep a, a wider flap that's documented that's one of the common uh, traits of leggings in the 18th century because you can fold it forward or backwards and it's an extra layer of wool that helps to protect your shins and your calves any wool will work but what you really want to get is a type of wool that's fairly densely woven and edge stable meaning it's not going to fray after you cut it one of the types of wool that you want to avoid here are loosely woven blanket style wools not because of the thickness the thickness is actually fine it's because that loosely woven material will begin to fray on the edges and as the nap or that kind of fuzziness of the wool wears off and you begin to see more of the weave itself it begins to betray the authenticity of your impression a little bit the wool that was traded for the most part to natives and whites during the, the deerskin trade during the entirety of the American frontier was typically a softer but more densely woven wool. So as you can see, leggings are one of the easiest and cheapest things that we can make. Just some blue, red, green, or even white wool that's fairly densely woven like a broadcloth or a similar type. It doesn't take very much measuring from just above my knee all the way down to just above my ankle and then uh, folding them over in a tube, pinning them in place and stitching them in place. And then for just a couple of dollars more, I add some of this wool tape as garters to hold it up. And for probably less than $30, I have a well-made, well-designed and very authentic piece of clothing. Another thing that I've done to really make my impression custom, but still very authentic, is to 
look at different types of shot bags and powder horns, and then get them reproduced into something that matches what I am trying to do. This simple bison horn has a red wool tape, that tape again dyed with matter root, and it's attached to the horn both front and back with laces of brain tan. Now this next horn that I have here is what's known as a green horn, and it refers to the actual color of the powder horn itself. It's the only horn that I own that has any scrimshaw or decorative work on the horn itself. I have the deerskin diary deer there in the center, and then I have a couple of floral designs that were taken from an original horn from the late 18th and early 19th century. It also hangs from my body with the matter dyed red wool, very simple plain woven tape and is attached to the horn by a couple of pieces of hemp cordage. And the last horn that I have is a very simple plain cow horn. It has a linen uh, undyed woven strap and that's just a piece of uh, diagonally woven linen tape. It's attached to the horn itself by a couple of brain tan uh, laces and it has a very plain wooden stopper also attached with a brain tan lace. This particular shot bag is made of brain tan buckskin. Again, I made it myself. Very simple, very little decoration, a single button closure, some small fringe on the flap, and a non-adjustable strap. It's got a little bit of the patching material hanging from the straps, as you'll see in several of the other bags in this video. Um, and it doesn't have to be elaborate to be authentic. As a matter of fact, the simpler, the better which means it doesn't cost nearly as much money to make or to acquire, and it really makes your impression something memorable. Now this is a shot bag that I made myself. I acquired the leather for not too much money, and with a couple of YouTube videos, I worked on my leather working skills and was able to produce a very simple shot bag that is based on an example from early frontier Virginia. It's a very simple bag with a a uh, triangular shaped flap, a single button closure. There's actually two bags on the inside. There's a non-adjustable strap on this one. I just measured it out and stitched it to the back and it's just, again, very simple and it doesn't cost a lot of money. This is the most elaborate hunting pouch that I have or shot bag. It's made of deer hide and uh, looks like calf skin or very uh, thin cow hide with a vegetable tan cow hide strap and an iron buckle. Now this particular bag is unique and special to me. Um, it's based upon the drawing of a Cherokee native from the middle part of the 18th century, I believe. It's a brain tan buckskin bag and it has a very simple, again, red wool, plain woven matter root dyed strap. Now what makes this unique and special to me is that this is part of an ongoing project where each of my kids will get a flintlock muzzleloader and they will get a shot bag and powder horn to go with it as something to remember their old man by. The uniqueness of the bag is that I am harvesting a deer with each of those muzzleloaders and then brain tanning the buckskin from that deer to make a shot bag. This happens to be my daughter's and this was from a doe that I harvested with the muzzleloader that she will get. And I encourage you to find little ways like that to turn these from living history uh, items into family heirlooms. Now one of the last things to talk about is actually not something that I wear on my body at all. This is a little bit different mentality here in the purchase and that is the purchase of a good 18th century reproduction blanket. Now these can be you know fairly costly so I chose to save quite a bit of money actually to purchase some of these um, but you can also find some pretty decent reproductions in places like eBay. Now one of the things that I choose to avoid are, are surplus military blankets they're just not quite the same but why a blanket? Well two reasons for me. Number one the blanket is one of the larger items that you would see on my person, either hanging from a tump line um, in some sort of uh, blanket roll fashion or tied to a knapsack or even worn as a, uh, as a, um, a blanket, a wrapped blanket style coat in the wintertime. Um, so there's quite a lot of surface area there that speaks a lot about who I am as a living historian. And secondly, it's one of the only items that, you know, oftentimes will remain in camp if you're off doing something else, visiting with friends, 
It's one of the only, only items that remains in camp. And it also speaks a lot about your impression when you're not there to speak for it yourself. I have four different styles of documented 18th century blankets. The first of which is a French four point blanket. Now it has four stripes here. This indicates the size. I have a size blanket that will actually cover my feet and my head at the same time, because who wants a blanket that won't do that? And it's probably the thickest blanket that I own. Now, a lot of people will say, well, hey, uh, this is the Southern frontier and that's a French blanket. They're more common in the North and Northwest. But remember the French were trading up and down the Mississippi River from places like Alabama and Louisiana. So these French four point blankets absolutely occur in the American South and in the American frontier all the way down to the Southern end. The next style of blanket I have is a British duffel style blanket. It's again white wool and it has two horizontal red stripes at the end. It's the second heaviest blanket that I own. Now the next two blanket types that I have here are also British duffel style trade blankets. One in red, one in blue. This red one I know is documented to Georgia because of the Von Reck image series that show a native woman wrapped in a blanket in this style. Now Rob Stone, and I'll put a link to his uh, page also in the description, made all of these blankets and this red one is reproduced from that image. He also does a blue one that uh, is from the same design and also uh, because blue was another color of horizontal stripe style on these duffel blankets that were traded along the American frontier. Why do I have two? I don't actually know. I think I just realized I have a blanket problem. Now, if you are interested in upgrading your current blanket to something that's a little more 18th century in style, there are a couple of traits I think you should look for. One of those being that the majority of the blankets in the 18th century seem to be made of white wool. Now, I know the first thing some folks are saying is, well, how does that white wool help me blend into the woods if I'm portraying a market hunter or a long hunter or a scouter or a spy? As we will see in a future Deerskin Diary video, the notions of camouflage in the 18th century diverge pretty sharply from what we think it means today. So there we have it. Five simple things that I did to change my impression from something that was fairly mundane or in some cases inaccurate to something that was far more memorable. I hope my methodologies and thought processes were easy for you to follow along and I hope it inspires you to either get into the hobby or if you're interested in changing something about your own impression into changing it into something that you like or feel more comfortable and confident in. And as always, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to spend with me as I chase these 18th century rabbits all the way to the bottom of their rabbit holes. We'll see you next time on the Deerskin Diary.